Hello, and welcome to part four, me answering the comments and the questions. So let's see, I'm going to start this up, and I'm going to have it just flicking along as I'm talking through everything. So, hope you enjoy. Right, starting off with the questions which were on the original Patreon live. Um, for starters, there's HMS King George V. I'm so sorry it's been so long. For some reason, I couldn't find you in my subscriptions, and I thought you were just not uploading. I should try to make it to the next one. Well, A, KGV. I was actually worried you were okay, so I'm glad to hear you're okay. I don't know why it wasn't turning up. I don't know about that one, but um, I'm glad you're okay, and I hope the chat's seen. From Carl Gansberg, HMS Radza Balmoro mentioned in the chat is a reference to the interwar fictional pulp stories of P. Howard. Albeit in Hungarian originally, it is a cruiser. They're small enough to even to be a sloop, since it had a skeleton crew of 20-something. That would sound definitely sloopish, almost trawlerish. Uh, then we have loaded dice. On the topic of animals creating a certain impression, Vince McCannon likes to say perception is reality. Definitely true. Um, one of the tricks you learn when you're lecturing. is how to be a presence in a room and when you need to be a presence. Now, when I'm doing these YouTube videos from home, I'm usually wearing my comfy t-shirts, which are variously sardonic and jokey. Leprechaun made me do it today. Um, and I love these shirts. But when I am... Lecturing, I am quite a young lecturer. Even in my early 30s, I'm still quite young. I have master students who are older than me, and I have postgraduate students who are older than me. I even have some undergraduate students who are older than me. So, I wear a shirt and tie. I look smart. I look like I'm in charge. I... There is always this wonderful thing, there's Charlie Epps on a program called Numbers. He's a professor at MIT, I think it is. Anyway. He's always wearing a t-shirt and a blazer. And it's sort of a case of, yes, I'm still wearing a t-shirt because I'm young and hip. But I'm wearing a blazer because I'm also the professor, and I'm in charge, and I need to differentiate myself. It's the same with admirals. The perception they can achieve by their actions is critical. Then there's John Nichols. I like your channel very much. One suggestion is that when you're reading a chat you find funny, you laugh throughout the reading. Makes it sometime somewhere between hard and impossible to understand. Please keep up this great channel. I, I, I'm sorry. I just laugh. I will try and remember to read them back properly after I've giggled the first time. Yikas, sorry I missed it. Don't worry. Hello, Boris Real. And then Graham, 1973. And he goes into a really good talk. I remember skimming a boy's own adventure book from 1905, whose title I've forgotten, which had as its plot line a Chinese official hiring a former RN officer to recruit up a group of mercenaries to form an anti-pirate fleet. As I remember it, they are paid enough up front to purchase free cruisers from Armstrong's, along with some destroyers from Fornicroft. The other thing I keep thinking of were two novels from late 1960s, early 1970s by Douglas Riemann both of which were set roughly contemporaneously with their publication date. In the first, Deep Silence, 1967, the plot has a sequence where a valiant class SSN 
He is sent off to rescue hostages from a ship captured by pirates while in transit from between South Korea and Taiwan. In a second, the greatest enemy, one of the major action sequences sees a Type 15 frigate go into action against a freighter captured by pirates, actually PLA personnel, in the Gulf of Thailand. The method used by the pirates to capture ship board as passengers with their weapons concealed aboard beforehand is clearly influenced by what was happening off China in the period you covered. True. And what's interesting is that um, Loaded Dice then responds, I'm going to go ahead and assume the boy's own book was, while well-meaning, horrifically racist if you read it today. I think I've read that boy's own book and possibly it would fit that category, but compared to some of the others, it really isn't. Um... Oh, my granddad, I have all the boys, so many boys' own books wandering around. And they are well-meaning for their time. You have to remember that quite a lot of them... It's like Teddy Roosevelt, when we talk about him. He was incredibly progressive for his time. And in fact, though, some of his policies actually are incredibly progressive for modern America. But there's also a lot of stuff of him which really isn't. And sometimes you have to put people in the context of their time and go, are you really progressive? Well, for your time, you were. And what I was trying to point out to people is there, for you to imagine something as possible, you first have to have a basis of what is possible now. Our imagination and this is true when it comes to strategy, when it comes to tactics, is limited to the, the world we already understand. So, for example, when I'm imagining space combat, I am probably still imagining it with my understanding of terrestrial combat on Earth and history of combat on Earth. It's an imagination. The reality is, though, space conflict could be very different, and different people with different experiences will imagine it in different ways. So when you are arguing for what might be considered a very progressive liberal agenda in the 1900s, which you imagine, and people are going, that's far out, that's massively progressive. Today might sound very staid and, you know, conservative, but that was at the time. It was as far as you can imagine. It's not as far as we can imagine now. Which means that the real limitation of humankind is no limitation because we can imagine things then we develop it and that pushes our imagination even further. We just have to always wait for the cycle of imagination to catch up with reality. Or reality to catch up with imagination. Depends on your perspective. And let's go to part one now. Right then. Old Richard, I can easily envisage Victorian naval officers laughing over drinks at the equality bit. Uh, to be honest, the British naval officers, the ones back in the UK, might have done. The ones in China, who saw how big China was and who had to deal with China, they probably thought it was freaking useful at that point. Remember that China goes through phases. It's on a downward slope, but it isn't going as far downward at the beginning when the Tianjin uh, Treaty is agreed as it is it would fall. As Carl von Gaspard points out, it's harder for China to, to accept equality in the face of obsessed eat Far East, especially when you consider China viewed itself as the middle kingdom between heaven and earth. Um, yeah, that's rather a big thing. Glenn McCurvey has also responded, The Emperor is equal to his Her Royal Highness Emperor of India. 
So long as traditional rights are observed, there is no complication, and admirals are equal to the highest command of the army, and thus nobles are armed. The complication is if admirals represent themselves appropriately given the complexity of ritual and tradition of tens of thousands of years. Probably the law was passed to encourage local governors to recognize captains equals as representatives of the Royal Navy instead of army commanders to order around. It's uh, more a case of... By making them equals, it means they work with them. They cannot ignore them. They have to assist them. They have to. Well, the, Na I don't know, the Navy has to assist them, but the locals have to assist them as well. They have to work together. And I often think that's why China actually, because they're acknowledging they do need help at this point, because despite what Admiral Zheng He had built up, the, Na the Chinese Navy at the time was nowhere near what it had once been. They need the help for counter piracy, and piracy is causing them a lot of trouble. China at this point isn't the failed state it will fall into, but it is heading in that direction. Shane F, thanks, Doctor. I do, do so enjoy your chat. I'm glad. Thank you. Jonathan Lee, on the point of equality, it is worth reading the letter to King George III from Queen Long Emperor in 1793. I have looked it up. It's a very cool letter. It's probably worthy of a video itself at some point in the future when I am not building a, uh, building an office and spending a large amount of time bashing things with either a mallet or a hammer, depending on which is necessary. Race car meerkat. Um, Captain selling off his own ship's propeller. I have did send you a link to it, um, but it does seem to have disturbed a few people. Yes, it, it is causing the bilge pumps crew regular humor. We're trying to work out how many podcasts we can work in references to it in. And then McLean McIlvery again. Um, China has always been a center of political debates. Fairly true. And uh, if you show up to ask questions without a squad of Marines and a few cannon armed with explosive shells... Don't expect anyone to come home when the local guards capture the entire ship on the orders of local management. Well, you don't really need the mar always need the marines. The sailors are fairly decent in the Royal Navy as well and tend to be quite protective of the ship. But having the marines along does suddenly make things a lot easier. And they can claim your troops attempted rebellion and punish them. While the Royal Navy sits there saying, wait, what? But that isn't how sailors behave elsewhere. Mm -hmm. To be honest, that is how Royal Navy sailors behave after the British Empire was captured by people on the on shore leave. Um, the reality is the amount of money needed to get into piracy, only wealthy merchants and powerful families could afford to build such boats, and the reward for performing was very lucrative, so it was in their interest to avoid catching the interest locally. Well, yes and no. Quite a lot of pirate. Well, it depends on the period you're talking about. Quite a lot of the sailing era piracy was the local fishing boats and which were fairly common and quite a lot of families had them i'm not talking the really poorest families but we're talking lower middle class would probably be classified as it um but yes if you're going to have more ships you've risen up the ranks chinese traditions are confusing and hard to explain without entire pages i would agree that's why I tend to not try and get into them too much, because I realize I only have a very loose grasp on them. I teach it on piracy in South China Sea and China, uh, off China. I te I, um, I've i taught it on a few modules over the years, and one, mod one lecturer in uh, any of those modules when I taught it. So... It's not something. It's something which I know and very interested in, and I look at from the Royal Navy's perspective quite a lot, and from interest enough the American Navy and the French Navy's perspectives. But it's not. I wouldn't say I know the Chinese customs and traditions are really enough to give a proper demonstration or discussion of it. Still hoping to see hints of a modern solution to current piracy problems. Well, there is really. It's basically try and stabilize the state. As the British found, once you had the Chinese nationalist government in power, things were great. And then you had the nationalist government ending up fighting the communists. 
things went down again, so they were dealing with the piracy issue again, and then the communists took charge, and they dealt with the piracy issue. The British don't mind. They prefer that if you have a fairly stable, fairly, uh, fairly, uh, how do I put this, organized state ashore, that isn't too interested in trying to bring down itself, it will tend to deal with piracy. Because a state which doesn't deal with piracy, which promotes and supports it, tends to bring down the wrath of other states, because that state's not playing by the rules. It can get painful. Quickly. Very quickly. Right. Let's go to part two. Ben Wilson. One reason that the Royal Navy would combat piracy was marine insurance. The city alone was the main supplier of marine insurance to the world at this time. For the London, the investors would like not to pay out insurance claims. True. Uh, the Royal Navy did get involved, uh, but mainly the Royal Navy saw its role as deterrence of piracy because it couldn't didn't physically have enough ships to be everywhere. I think the exact figure the Royal Navy gave to the government was if they wanted them to start to start preventing piracy completely, a they would have to introduce a convoy system, b they would have to treble the number of sloops on the South China stairs on the China Station and double the number of light cruisers. And that was the estimate given in the mid-1930s, mid when there was a nationalist government beginning to take power over the whole of China. Because remember, in 1928, theoretically, China is unified, but honestly, it takes a few years for them to really get it together. Stafford Thompson. Unsurprisingly, considering the size of it, okay, this again, when you say things something like that, sometimes you go, oh, that's being, you're being very rude about them, or you're you know, giving them agency, or these things. No, no, no. It's a massive country. You have just been through decades of war, strife, and dispute. Your control is shaky at best. The fact that within five years you've reached the point at which you've got gunboats and troops that you can actually reliably send free up from what else they're doing and send to deal with piracy is a major astonishing feat. Okay? Do not diminish it. But that, again, that doesn't mean it was easy and it doesn't mean it happens overnight. And honestly, as you've, as Ben Wilson pointed out, Britain isn't really that bothered about the internal operations of China as long as it's able to make money from its interests in China and its trade is able to flow. Stafford Thompson. The more things change, the more they say the same, eh, Doctor? It sounds to me that these lessons have been forgotten a means upon which we kept them at bay were neglected. Anti-piracy operations are the perfect means of continuous sustained building development program equals jobs, prosperous future for all parties involved. Okay, perhaps not the pirates. Would a Type 45 and Batch 2 rivers be able to fulfill the same role now a days, or have navies stay, stray too far from roads? Um, keep up the good rate work. Take care and best wishes. Always, Doctor. Well, Stav Thompson, um, I've heard you've been having problems at home. I hope they get better soon. And thank you for your kind words, as always. And would a Type 45 and Batch 2 rivers? Batch 2 rivers, certainly, but... Type 45, Type 31 probably would be better for it. And I can see the Type 31 doing a lot of that role. The Type 45 is very much the heavy cruiser equivalent. Same with the Type 26s. Type 31, I see, is sort of the light cruiser present ship. And... The rivers could well fit in the sloop role, especially if they could be given some rotary UAVs or something which would um, extend their search range. Kingsrook, if a submarine conducts anti-piracy operations, is it still appropriate for the sub to fly the Jolly Roger when returning to port? Carl van Gasper replied, well, when she paint, the subs paint their kills on the sail tower, 
so that Dread Roger gets onto the boat one way or another. And Glenn McGilly. Uh, Carl goes, how would one fly pirate's flag while submerged? I would wonder just how strong the fabric and flagpole would be to resist the water drag. Yes, I know flags are for flying in the air, but what if they had to perform an emergency dive, or perhaps wanted to rise from depths as deep as a deadly leviathan bearing prize acquired from its latest acquisition as a port into doom against the pirates? I envision this in my head of an attacking sub barring no less than a dozen flags strung from single miles as though crows hanging from a fence. Calvin Gasman. Glenn McGilly, it is tradition specifically to fly the flag when returning to their home port. Hopefully they do last part surfaced with some publicity. Not in the form of visiting bows or stukas, for example. Ben Wilson, the tradition was started by Lieutenant Commander Horton, commander of HMS E9, after sinking German light cruiser SMS Heller on the 13th of September 1914. Later Admiral Sir Max Kennedy Horton, GS, GCB DSO in two bars, S, S, S um, Samarina SGM in charge of Western approaches in World War II, taking over after Admiral Noble, who of course commanded the China Station in 1939. Now, yes, the answer is they do get to fly the Jolly Roger when returning home to port because. They did their mission. It worked well. Uh, Glenn McGovey. So we need long-range nuclear submarines with deck guns off Somalia. No. We need to fix the Somalian economy first, so they can work playing jobs instead of paying pirates. Then we need 10-inch guns mounted on submarines to point at silly pirates. It's actually just a blank tube with a 4-inch AP, uh, AP pop gun in, to hit important targets. Hmm... Here's the thing, you can only fit the Somali, fix the Somali economy if you can have a central government that has buy-in from the public. You need to provide stability. You, can, you cannot produce an economy in a war zone. You cannot produce um, uh, all these things out of nowhere. And you can't... Uh, Somalia has, is one of those nations which has been really poorly served not just by international power of nations getting involved in its internal politics, but by its political classes for decades. Hopefully it gets better soon, and hopefully they find a way. Finally, part four. Well, no, part three. <laughs> Boris Real. Fluffy research assistant's barking scared the beep out of me. Well, he does sometimes like to be the very woofy research assistant, or the VWRFA, all right, uh, when he's um, feeling in gar mode, dog mode. As you can see, he's asleep now. Great su uh, Stafford Thompson. Great summaries, I saw. I especially liked the bit at the end and about changing one's stripes of survival. Keep up the great work. Take care and best wishes as always, Doctor. Thank you. And, yes, you do change your stripes of survival. It happens a lot. Worked well in China in that period. Whoa. Glenn McGillivray. Wait, 1930s Japan versus... USA, due to murder of Charlie Chaplin. I know it seems far-fetched, but that's what they believed. Uh, they believed... Their, uh, their focus on America was that America was a, a vacuous, weak, celebrity-obsessed society, and therefore, by murdering the most popular celebrity, you would make war inevitable, and that would be glorious victory for Japan because they were so weak. And he says, I want a video war gamed. I think USA steamrolls once they learn to land troops, while Britain tries to maintain neutrality while policing the sea trade in the region. It sounds awesome. Not the actual war, I mean, the war gamed video. 
more game video could be interesting, but um, I don't think Britain stays neutral. There's a problem if you stay neutral. If you stay neutral and then you're attacked in Europe, you have no support. Whereas if you get involved and you are fighting, and you're fighting in the Far East, if someone in Europe then kicks off and you, well, they've got to kick off against both you and your ally. And you are the two most powerful nations on Earth. Plus all the dominions and empires. It just, it's not a good scenario for anyone to get and start knocking on those doors. Calvin Gasberg, praise be. I'm presuming it's Blackburn, Blackburn time. John Shea, Doctor, be like, you're done yet? Thank you. Just amazing. I br that was to my dog. Yes. King's Rook, bork, bork, bork. Yeah. Uh, the VWRA says hello. Jack, friend in Poland, fluent in Japanese, with interest in naval history. Is he Michael Pezek? No, he's not. My friend is an exceptional economist called Tom Hashimoto. And you can actually look him up. I think he teaches at Warsaw University. He did his PhD at Oxford. He is an absolutely spectacular um, young man and colleague. I actually met him teaching in Cambridge on a summer course but he strange enough he did his masters he did a masters where he popped into Kings and did naval history under Andrew Lambert as well it's sometimes called the Lambert Mafia or Lambert Collective because he does seem to collect a whole load of us and really really cool guy and is Helping with this stuff on occasion because he is super. And I'm going to try and get him if he's interested to do a YouTube video at some point because I think it'd be fun. Slightly crazy, but fun. Considering, um, yeah, him and I had uh, some fun times. We were with a we were the old hands with a much younger teaching crowd. And um, we'd occasionally keep an eye on them when they went out drinking at night. And we sort of, Tom would drink a lot of, let's say, the other Scottish drink, not iron, the non iron brew one. And there'd be me drinking iron brew. And we'd be sitting in the corner chatting away about naval history and various things and making sure that nothing untoward happened to our colleagues who were. Uh, uh, less capable of absorbing the liquids they were imbibing. Lovely people, though. And it was the nights off, so no one, no student suffered, no student were there. They were all very good. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, we'll go through this to the end point again. I'm not sure if it's already gone round here. But... Da -da 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 Yes. So, the two upcoming patron choice in February are the Royal Navy Strategic Role in 1982 and Fast Attack Craft. And I will be putting up the patron suggestion uh, some point on Friday the 5th of February. And with its closing being the 12th of February, with me putting the questions live on the 14th of February and announcing winners on 21st of February. That's the plan. And hopefully I have an office to do it in. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed these. Please, if you do like, like, maybe subscribe, possibly press the little bell down there. Maybe join Discord or patron to indulge my book habit. Whatever you do, I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you very much for watching. Take care.